Living for Jesus is not something we do halfway. You know, God calls us to be committed. You think about this again, you know, I've talked about this in a previous presentation, that living for Jesus is like a wedding. Jesus, God uses the analogy of a wedding. You imagine, you know, how, how excited would you be going into a, a marriage knowing that the other person is only going into it with one foot in? How, how good would you think your chances are of a successful marriage, right? You commit, yes, you, you commit 100% or you don't commit at all. And that God asks the same thing. He asks of us the same thing we would expect from an earthly partner, right? 100% commitment. We're all in. It's 100%, 100%, right? God's clearly demonstrated in what he has done through the person of Jesus Christ and through all of human history he has demonstrated the fact that he's 100% in, right? The thing is for us is we have to recognize that when we're living for Jesus, we need to do things 100%. Jesus wants to do something radical with our lives. He wants to do something special with our lives. He expects to put to death our old natures through the Holy Spirit. It's not meant to be business as usual. If we have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and yet we're continuing to live the way we used to before we met Jesus, then we have misunderstood some very important things that God is teaching us in his word. God's looking to create in us a new nature. He's looking to make us new creatures. And so then that will demonstrate itself in how we live our lives. We will live our lives differently. Romans 6, 3-4 Paul says this, he says, Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Right? And so we, when we are baptized, we're baptized into the death of Jesus so that we can then live with Jesus. Baptism is an outward act of something that has already happened inside, right? And so when we get baptized, when we come in, in before a people, before a Christian group, and you get baptized, it should already have been the case that we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And there should already be an indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. And now we are ready to make that statement public for everyone to see. We have new priorities. We have a new heart. We uh, change our everyday habits, uh, what we liked before we don't like anymore, what we did before we don't do anymore. We have new habits and new practices. For some of you, given how you, the backgrounds that you've had, the thought that you would be sitting here listening to a presentation in church would have been unthinkable at one point in your life. There are people watching online where it's the same thing, where they've had, they had no interest in spiritual things, no interest in spirituality. And somebody would talk to them and go, oh, go talk to somebody else, you know, you, you, you know and, and would accuse them of being fanatics or, or lunatics or, or imbalanced, whatever. And now you find yourself wanting to hear about God, reading about God, praying to God, looking forward to being able to gather together. These are things and habits that are implanted in us by God and by the Holy Spirit. In fact, if we find ourselves no longer enjoying church, that's a warning sign. It's a red flag that we've allowed the world to creep back into our life in such a way that it's choking out the word. It's choking out the presence of God. It isn't God's plan. Romans 6.13 says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. This is, the, this is what God is calling us to do. We are to do good. We are to do what is righteous, and we are to avoid what is evil. Uh, we choose to do only those things that are in harmony with God's word. If we call ourselves Christians, if we call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, then we will avoid doing those things that bring reproach and shame on Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? We're going to avoid going to places that bring shame. Uh, we're going to avoid habits that bring shame to Jesus. We want to live our lives in harmony with God's word. Now, it is true that for us, I mentioned uh, you know, that we are like babies and so sometimes, you know, babies will make mistakes. Young, don't, the young don't always do what they're told, right? They don't always, they're not always wise in their decision making. 
We all know that, especially if you've had been around teenagers. Uh, you know, especially teenagers are, are, are spreading their wings and they're trying to figure out where they are in the world. And oftentimes they will make decisions that the, the parents or grandparents are going to scratch their heads and wondering, what, you know, what color is the sky in your world anyway, right? <laughs> because sometimes some crazy things can come out. But you know what? We can be like that with God, but God is patient. God is kind. God is merciful. And so if we find ourselves veering to the left or to the right, we will hear the Holy Spirit, and we will sense the Holy Spirit telling us, no, no, this is the way. Walk ye in it. We have that actually in, in Isaiah 26, where we have it. You will hear a voice behind you saying to you, this is the way. Walk you in it. Because God guides us. We're not left alone. We're not, when we have Jesus, when we've accepted Jesus, our Lord and Savior, he comes and he dwells in us. And as he dwells in us, he guides us if we will listen to him. And we will allow him to lead. Right? So according to Jesus, baptism is important. We see this in John 3, 5, where he says, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, he was talking to Nicodemus here, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the water part of it is the public baptism. And you do that public baptism in order to show to the world who you serve. We'll talk a little bit more about that soon here. Now, there are three evils that can lead us away from Christ. Three evils that can lead us from Jesus. The first one is Satan. Of course, we've talked a lot about him in this uh, series so far. The second one is the world. The world is under the control of the evil one. And the world will often tell us to, that what we believe in doesn't make sense. Or it will say, hey, come on, it doesn't hurt. We've all been the, the victims of peer pressure in one form or another to try to force us and convince us to do things that we later regret doing. This is the world's influence. And then the third voice that is going to lead us astray is our own flesh. What we've got, talked about at length so far in this series, which is that sinful nature that is within us that is in harmony with Satan because it is uh, the dark a void inside of us that causes all of humanity to be in rebellion to God. And uh, one of the, re the prim primary reasons is God's going to have to recreate us and give us all new bodies is because of the fact that our old bodies have this nature in it that needs to die, needs to go. Now, uh, Romans 7, 18 to 20 talks about this. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what, I, what is good I do not find. For the good I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin dwells in me. Right? So before Jesus, before accepting Jesus, there was no battle. We did whatever we wanted to do, and we were relatively content at doing that. Of course, you can't really have the peace, right, when you're not following Jesus, but you don't have a sense of the battle because you're just doing whatever feels good, whatever feels right. That's what the world is doing. And when the world looks at us as Christians and we're bringing up the Word of God and saying this is not according to the Word of God, they get upset at us. They get angry at us because what we're telling them is that their feelings are going to lead them to their destruction, and they don't want to hear that. They want to stay asleep, and they want to just keep going. And that's where we were before we accepted Jesus. You wanted to do evil, and you enjoyed it. I just have this picture because of you know Netflix and places like that. You saw all kinds of stuff that you can watch online that's not good for you, right? But we'll watch it anyway because of our natures. And now that you follow Jesus, a dark power fights you. We have the dark power of Satan, who will whisper thoughts into your mind, that you wouldn't otherwise had. And too many people don't realize this. And when they get these negative thoughts, they, don't, they take ownership of them when they shouldn't. Because the evil one gives you thoughts in your mind. You need to replace those thoughts with good thoughts. It's one of the reasons why singing can be a good thing. Or listening to praise music. Or, or memorizing scripture. You know, Jesus himself used that practice, right? When he was in the wilderness with the temptations. It is written. It is written. It is written. We, we should not give in to those, those thoughts. We also have the dark, thought, the dark powers of the world who are going to give us different ideas and, and different philosophies and different understandings that are going to go against God. You can find, for instance, um, one of the ones just recently, and I mentioned this also recently, but 
uh, was a book that I read on, written by a, uh, an atheist who was writing to Christians, you know, and, and, and he's trying to bring up all the arguments about why God is inconsistent, if God is real, why did this and why that and why this other thing. If you do not have a proper grounding in your faith and you were to come across something like that and read it, it can shake some people's faith. I remember years ago, I got an email. All the pastors of my conference uh, got an email here in Ontario uh, from a member who had watched a video on YouTube about an hour and a half long that went into the reasons why uh, this particular person who had done the video had left the faith. And this person was a Seventh-day Adventist uh, who had even studied for ministry. Turns out that actually he and I were friends, the guy who made this video. I went to school with him at CUC, which is now Berman uh, University, uh, and uh, he had lost his way. And this other person had seen this video and was now distraught, and they said that their faith was, was wrecked, and they were looking for answers. Please give me answers, because they had watched this video, and it had, it had shaken their foundation. And this is the thing that can be dangerous. That's the world the power of the world that can come in. And if we don't have a firm foundation, it can knock us off of our, of, of, of our uh, foundation on Jesus. And then, of course, we have the dark power of our natures, our natural natures, our fleshly natures. And if we follow our impulses, we're going to be in trouble. Famously in Star Wars, you have Luke uh, being told by Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke, follow your feelings, trust your feelings. Worst advice you could ever have. Trust your feelings, you'll end up in the fires of hell. You'll end up in the lake of fire. We can't, it's not that feelings, all feelings are wrong, okay? But most feelings are going to be perverted or through the lens of the, of the sinful nature. You must guard your feelings and filter them through the word of God so that you can recognize which are good impulses and which ones are bad ones. And some people mistakenly think that once we accept Jesus, everything is easy. This is one of the things that I try to do when I prepare people for baptism is to help them understand that you're coming into a war. This is a war zone. The war is only beginning. Now, God is gracious and he is good to new Christians. And I have found in general, somewhere between a year to a year and a half, a new Christian is going to have a certain measure of grace and a certain measure of peace in their life and of joy. But they have to make sure they have a grounding in the word of God because at some point that, that grace starts to get withdrawn because God wants you to stand by faith in him and not by feeling. And he's going to start to withdraw some of that. And you have to be ready because this is a battle. This is a fight. Some people mistakenly think, hey, if I could just get into that, to the tank and get baptized, then I'm going to be, um, I'm just going to be all better. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to have the dark fighting of, with sin that I had before. But that is not reality. That is, in fact, uh, a, can be a snare. I just lost my cord here. Just a second. It could be a snare of Satan to think that because then when we have some kind of trouble, if you're not prepared, if nobody has warned you, and then you start to have some, some, some trouble, you can start to think, oh no, all is lost. Satan loves that, by the way. You know, it's, it's also why if you understand the flesh, you can understand if you, st if you neglect your time with God, the flesh gets stronger. The flesh can get so strong to the point where you no longer have an appetite for spiritual things. And then if you don't know about the flesh and the spirit, you can get to the point where you think, oh, all's lost. I've gone too far. No, you haven't. All you have to do is go back to the first things. Go back to what you did at the beginning, which means that you've got to go back to spending time with Jesus. You've got to go and confess your sins. You've got to go cut out the things that you started to allow into your life that aren't right. And if you do that and you spend time in prayer and you seek God again, you will find that God will reveal himself back to you and you will have peace again. It's not hard. It's not complicated. It's like, I talk about it like a device like this. You have a power source. What happens when the battery runs out? Does this thing work like it's supposed to? No. It becomes like one man who is gifted the, an iPad of the first version. You know, it was brand new on the market. Didn't know any better. His, his, uh, his uh, uh, one of his children had gifted him an iPad. He didn't know what it was, so he was using it as a cutting board. <laughs> if you don't know to turn it on, right, then you look at this nice flat surface glass, you think, hey, all right, great, it's a good cutting board, right? Very expensive cutting board. But if you have no power in this thing, then that's all it's probably good for. <laughs> okay? Well, for us, the power source as Christians is the power of God who lives in us. 
And if the power of God isn't living in us, and we might as well be like iPad, that iPad, we're not going to be able to do what God intends for us to do. We're not going to be able to say no to sin. We're not going to be able to have the victory over sin. We're not going to be able to love our enemies. We're not going to be able to love each other and be in unity because we have neglected our time with God and our connection with God. It is God's power in us that gives us the ability to live a victorious life. Neglect your time with God, and eventually that power is gone, and then you fall flat on your face. And we end up, as, as Christians, being no different than the world. Because the secret sauce, if you will, okay, the secret sauce, the secret weapon for us as Christians is God in us. It's not, Christianity isn't just about a philosophy. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just having the right knowledge combination. We're not saved by our knowledge. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And that faith in Jesus Christ works us out when Jesus is allowed to live in us. And when he lives in us, he empowers us to be able to live a righteous life. Um, God is our refuge and strength, and we don't have to be anxious, right? Because he is with us. He fights our battles. I like this graphic here. You know, the man with the... It's like we're just this one small, weak human being, but with God behind us, every, you know, the evil will run. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you want to have a life free from anxiety? Do you want to have a life that has this peace of God that surpasses understanding? It requires us to trust in God and to walk with Him. Now, again here, some of us are, have figured this out easier than others. So some of us have been through really hard life. We've had a lot of bad things happen to us. It makes it hard for us to trust people. You know, if you've had, for instance, a bad uh, father, it's going to be hard for you to see God as father. And God understands that and He has patience with us. So I don't want people beating themselves up, but God does want you to get to the place where you can no longer have to worry. He does want you to get a place where peace passes understanding. He does want to heal your heart if you will trust him. See, this, is, this, uh, this Christian life is about faith, walking by faith. Now, baptism happens once, but we must submit to God daily. So in the Bible, it doesn't tell you keep getting baptized every week or every month or every year. Usually, baptism should be one time, but on a daily basis, we have to submit ourselves to God. Uh, Jesus said this in Luke 9. He said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So, how should we be baptized? Uh, well, in John 3, 23, we read, it says, Now Jesus, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. The key word here is the fact that there is much water. Jesus, uh, John was baptizing in a river where there was much water because the whole purpose of the ritual is to go under the water. I could talk to you about the Jewish ritual, for instance, um, where uh, they, they call it a mikvah. And a mikvah is a, a source of water, usually that has a connection to a natural uh, body of water. So if it's a river or rainwater. They can have a mikvah indoors, but a, a mikvah indoors has to have rainwater from outside that comes in. So it has to be living water, in other words. But then they go into the mikvah, and Jews, they do their ritual cleansing. When they do the ritual cleansing, they have to immerse themselves completely under the water in this ritual cleansing. Uh, for instance, uh, if they've done, they, when they do, did certain things that were unclean, a woman in her period as an example would be one example of that. Orthodox Jews will go into a mikvah in order to do the ritual cleaning necessary to restore themselves, to, uh, to remove the impurities. Well, it's from that tradition that we find baptism coming from, but it, a lot of the other stuff will fell away. And what we have instead is the example that Jesus gave us, which is that you go under the water, you are submerged, submerged under the water, and it has, uh, uh, it's not just sprinkling, because some traditions do sprinkling. The Greek word is actually baptizo, which means immersion. I have a picture here, it's not very good, but it's a picture of, uh, you know, like dye. So if you're going to put dye in the water, you're going you're gonna to baptize it, you're going to immerse it in water completely. If you take dye and you put it, how they sprinkle on it, what are you going to get? 
just dots on the thing. It'll be tie-dye or something like that, right? It's not going to be properly immersed. Well, this is the idea of, of the word uh, for, for baptism. Sprinkling doesn't need uh, much water, but when you look at it, nowhere in Scripture do we find infants being sprinkled. This is not coming from Scripture. It's coming from tradition, from man's tradition. And Jesus himself was not sprinkled. He went uh, and was baptized under the water. The act of baptism symbolizes our death to sin. So you're going into the grave. Okay, that's what it symbolizes. In Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 3, it says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Now, none of us would want to get uh, buried in an actual grave, right? Who, who, would, who would be okay with that? That'd be super creepy, right? So when we do this in the water, we, and I point back here because we have a baptistry back here, okay? You have a, uh, either it's done in a, in a large tub or it's done in a river. You would go all the way under the water because when you bury somebody, you don't leave body parts hanging out of the grave, Right? Okay, that's very bad, right? Stinky, right? And, and, and would desecrate the, the grave. You know, you go all the way under. And so it's the same way when it comes to the water. We go all the way under to symbolize that we are buried with Christ. Our old life is dead. We have left our old life behind. And when we come back up by faith, we come back up with Jesus Christ. And through the power of his resurrection, by faith, we are connecting to the resurrection power of Jesus Baptism is a public symbol of our relationship to Christ and the world. It's like, if you will, uh, the marriage ceremony in a way. Because it's kind of, we don't do this in a, in a wedding. It'd be kind of weird, okay, to do this in a wedding. But when it comes to God, when we are dead and we come back up by faith, we are now children of God. We now belong to God. We are now adopted by God. And so we are now committed and, 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 and you know, uh, unify, un, united with God. Galatians 2.20 says, uh, we are, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so as a Christian, we recognize our old life is gone. And this is what baptism symbolizes. We've left the old life. We're now living the new life in Christ. Our lives will demonstrate our changed heart, and there will be uh, evidence of God's Spirit living within us. And some of the evidences are like the fruit of the Spirit, as found in Galatians 5, and 23, where it says, For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So when the Holy Spirit is in us, these are the fruit that are going to start showing themselves in our life. The Holy Spirit will start maturing us in Christ. This is also an indication that we have the right connection with God. If we don't have this, if we don't have these, these, these characteristics of, of, um, of peace and love and joy, like it says, if we don't have kindness and goodness and, and, and gentleness and self-control. It's an indication that there's something sick in our relationship with God. This is what God intends to produce in us. Too often, unfortunately, people can be in the church their entire lives and never demonstrate these fruit. And that's because they have not surrendered themselves as they should to the movement and spirit of God. Now, uh, spiritual maturity is learning to distinguish between good and evil. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Right? So through our study of the Bible, through counsel of, of, spirit, of spiritually mature brothers and sisters, through preaching of the word, we learn to avoid evil and embrace good. We learn what is wrong, and we learn what is right. And we, we hopefully are choosing to do what is right, and we avoid doing what is wrong. And we, uh, Romans 13, 14 tells us, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So if you have a trouble with alcohol, what's the worst place you could go? The bar, right? 
And uh, if you have uh, trouble, you know, uh, with gambling, should you ever go to a casino? <laughs> right? If a person's got a gambling problem and you find them in the casino and they try to tell you they're not gambling, you know it's just a matter of time before they're going to start again, right? Why would you put yourself in that kind of temptation? Well, it's the same when it comes to anything in our life. There are things in our life of which you are naturally drawn to and your flesh wants to do. If you put yourself in that situation, it's going to cause you to do it unless you put a margin of, of uh, safety around you. Learn to change we need to learn to change our personal habits and stop doing anything harmful to us or our bodies. Again, this is a progress kind of thing. Um, most of us are hard-headed. Okay? Most of us have to be run over by the bus a few times to learn things. Okay? I, you know, some of us are, are smarter than others, maybe. I don't know. Okay? But most of us are stubborn. And, and God's got to teach us through the school of hard knocks. And sometimes it's going to be over and over and over again. Good thing that when Jesus talked about how often should you forgive. Remember Peter said seven times, Lord? What did Peter say? He says, no, 70 times seven, right? You know, it's not that God will only forgive us 490 times. The, the thought was just keep forgiving. And thankfully, we have a God that keeps forgiving us because we are a stubborn and stiff-necked people. We're no different than the Israelites of old when God had said that to them, right? But fortunately, we serve a merciful God, a loving God, and just because we may have trouble, let's say with our tempers, and we lose our tempers, then we can get down on ourselves. We just have to confess that and get back on and say, God, help me the next time. And maybe the next time you do well. And then the third time you fall again. Well, you confess and you come back up. And then God will teach you through that process. But we have to recognize that we cannot ever make excuses for our sins. But we need to, rec we, we, we need to look to the standard, look to Jesus, and trust that he will take us through. Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 16 and 18 says, Do you not know uh, that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the ones, that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So it's just uh, slavery was common in, the, in, in Paul's day. And uh, you could be a slave to a good master. You could be a slave to a bad master. And so he's saying, now that you've been freed from this bad master and you've become a slave to a good master, then serve him well, because be thankful for the fact that you've been freed. So how does that translate to us today? Well, it'd be said to say, listen, we have been given by Jesus Christ the ability to say no to our old habits. So don't go back to those old habits. So if you go back to those old habits, you're going to get enslaved by them again. So instead willingly place yourself under the control of God and he will give you the victory. If you do go back to your old habits and you need to confess them and you need to come back to God, the same thing. How do I get free of them? You've got to go back to the beginning. You've got to go back to the beginning. You've got to confess the sin. You've got to purge it from your life. You've got to do whatever you need to to get right with God. And then if you trust and rely on God, God will give you the victory over it. But we have to be careful not to presume on God, Right? Because sometimes we'll say, well, God will forgive me, so it's okay if I go and do this. We can get into some seriously bad stuff. Uh, David, for instance, with Bathsheba would be an example of that. Where you just say, hey, God is a merciful God. He's going to forgive me. I'll just go and... No, wait a minute. Look at the price David paid, right? God is not going to be mocked. You will reap what you sow. So don't intentionally play with that because you, in David's case, not only did he have to deal with the humiliation, the public humiliation when it all came out, but his kids just were a complete mess from his out-of-control sexual addiction and from his rape of Bathsheba. His own son ended up, uh, he had two sons actually, they ended up raping as a result of the example of their father. So you reap what you sow and that, that, that can just get ugly. So why would you go there, right? Just do the right thing from the beginning and trust God in that. Now baptism tells the world who you serve. You belong to Jesus Christ. It's a public uh, acknowledgement of your love for Christ. Some people don't want to do that in the church. Some people want to do it alone out in the river. The problem with that is that you're divorcing it from the people of God. Why would you hide that? Why would you go off on your own to just hide your confession to God? No, if you have chosen to follow Jesus, then you should be open about it. You, again, come back to a relationship. Imagine a relationship you're in with somebody who every time you go out in public, they act like they don't know you. Right? 
How, how, how excited would you be to continue in that relationship? I think most of us here would understand that that relationship would be toxic, right? Because that person clearly is just using us. And for us too, if we are going to go before, we're going to confess God in private, but then when we go in front of other people, we're going to act like we don't believe in God, okay, and expect that God's going to be okay with that. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't want that in a human context. Why would we expect God to be okay with that? Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him also I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Well, you know, so, so very clearly, right? We need it. It's public. So what's holding you back from being baptized? If you haven't been baptized, what's holding you back from being baptized? Okay? There are two ways Christians baptize today. And which way is the right way? We've, we've kind of touched on it. We'll, talk, we'll just deal with it a little bit more. Matthew 1, nine says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And so Jesus himself was baptized by immersion in a river. Right? He wasn't sprinkled. There's, you, you know, I won't get in. There are sometimes movies that show Jesus being sprinkled. That's because they are influenced by, uh, you know, the Catholic faith. And, they're, and the Catholics are the ones who introduce sprinkling. This is not the biblical way. Biblical way, Jesus would have been through immersion. Baptism is simulated death. Okay? So, as I said about sticking out, you wouldn't just throw a bit of dirt on a body and think that that body is buried. Right? In the same way for us, we have to be completely immersed in order to be considered dead. So baptism shows the world that our old life is dead. And the only way between sprinkling and between immersion, it's only immersion that properly shows that symbol. It shows us being completely immersed. In other words, you're dead to your old life, buried. And as I said earlier, none of us would want to be actually buried in order to prove our commitment to Jesus. And thankfully, we don't have to do that. Do you know that in history, the people have been buried alive? Many times, there's even been situations where they had bells installed. People had bells installed in their coffins so that if they were buried and they were still alive, they could ring the bell to let somebody know that they were, they were alive. You know, and that's because a lot of times people would go unconscious. Medical advances weren't like they were today, right? So somebody could be unconscious and people thought they were dead and then they would bury them. So that's like, uh, you know, it's, it's a deep fear for any of us. That would be like a horrific experience. Fortunately, we don't have to deal with any of that. God makes it super easy and clear for us to just be able to do it in water and out, in and out. And even if you're afraid of water, it doesn't take long. It just goes in and then it goes out, right? And we do this so publicly. We've uh, looked at this verse here again, but I'll just read it one more time. It says, do you not know that many of us, as we're baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so to just to repeat again, when we come up, when we go down, it's our old life, we're dying. Our old life is dying. Our old natures are dying. When we come back up, we're coming back up with Christ. We're now a new creation. We're now coming up anew. And now we're coming up with Christ. So Christ's old death, we are crucified with him. And then he's resurrected. We're resurrected with him by faith. So this is all by faith. That's what these symbols are. By faith, we're connecting ourselves to the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And so that's what we're doing with that. So the question then, you know, will you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I hope you will, right? We just saw this in Matthew 10, right? It says, whoever confesses me before men, I'll also confess before my fathers in heaven. That condition is very clear. If you're not going to confess him publicly, he will deny you before God. And if he's denying you before your father, what hope do you have? You have no hope, right? So God's just saying, hey, put your money where your mouth is, right? Are you serious about me? Do you love me? If you love me, you will be open about it. We're not quiet about somebody we love, right? We don't go in the closet about somebody we love. We confess it. And that's what God is asking of us. So when we follow Jesus, our life will reflect this new freedom that we have in him. Uh, John 8, 34 and 36, Jesus answered him and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free 
indeed. God has called us to freedom in Jesus. We hold on to Jesus knowing that without him, we are powerless against sin. Without him, we have no hope, right? We are looking to be free in Jesus. Some people uh, want some people want to wait until they are perfect before being baptized. And that is a mistake because we cannot be perfect without Christ. And if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then nothing should stop you from, from publicly confessing him and being baptized. Perfection doesn't come from our performance. Perfection comes from Christ's performance, right? Perfection comes from our accepting by faith the performance of Jesus because his performance becomes our performance. His death is our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. It's all done by faith. I've also heard the opposite. I've heard people saying, I've done too many bad things in order to be forgiven by God. But that also is to misunderstand the mercies of God. There is nothing you or I could do. There's no level of evil we could do that could not be forgiven. The, what, what, the only thing that cannot be forgiven is the sin that is not confessed and repented of, right? So even a person like uh, Hitler or a Stalin who has killed literally millions, tens of millions of people of blood on their hands, if they honestly and genuinely had repented, God would forgive them. And that boggles the mind for us as human beings, of course, because most people would want to see them burn for a long, long time, right? But that speaks to the fact that nobody is outside of the salvation of God, Anybody who turns from him, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. But we have to believe. We have to believe that it's true. Can we please God without Christ? Can we, <clears throat> can we live a righteous life without the new birth? The answer is no. Romans 8, 7, and 8 says, The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The flesh must die, and the flesh will only die through Jesus Christ in us, for us allowing Jesus to have his way. Some people say, well, I've already given my life to Jesus. Hopefully everybody here is in that, in that camp, and if that's the case, then great. Praise the Lord. But then are you living up to your commitment? Because this is the thing, when anybody is making a commitment like that, then that helps us, the rest of us, to be reminded of the fact that we made a commitment to Jesus too. And we need to make sure that our commitment with Jesus is right. So for, for, a, sec, for a few moments here, I'll just talk to all of you who have made this decision already and already been baptized. You know, we can allow the cares of this world to drag us down. We can allow our old habits to drag in. Sometimes we can allow bad new habits to come in. But just like, you know, for the unrighteous, for us too, those who are a part of the redeemed, you can still change your habits. You can still turn things around. God will still forgive you if you will confess it and turn from it. We all should be experiencing the abundant life, and I hope we all are. Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I've talked about this in previous presentations, but sometimes the worst witnesses for God are God's people. Right? Sometimes we have been guilty of doing things that have brought reproach upon God, that have caused the blasphemy towards God. We have misrepresented God's character to the world. We need to be sure that individually, each one of us is not doing that so that we can live a life that is worthy of God. Let us not be ashamed of Jesus Christ and may God help us boldly live for him. Let us our lights uh, shine so others will praise God. As Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Is there enough evidence to convict you of being Christian in a court of law? Hopefully there is.